The United States is on the decline. Massive protests have erupted all across the entire country, with Donald Trump deciding to declare anti-fascism akin to terrorism. The state has authorized its militarized police forces to assault, brutalize, attack, and even murder its own citizens if they dare protest their government. These militarized assault forces are the fist of the fascist state and serve only one purpose to protect the capital investments and private property of the elites. Hi, my name is Aaron, this is my show Reeducation, and today we're going to talk about the stages of revolution, and whether or not the United States is in one of those stages. With all that being said, let's get started. So as I said at the top of this video, obviously the United States is currently in a decline, but we're going to find out if this decline is in fact part of a larger picture, possibly a revolutionary picture. A lot of people out there are saying this is the revolution, this is the revolution, and a lot of people are saying this is nothing close to a revolution, this is just a small blip and it's going to all be over and everything is going to go back to normal right after this. Um, and I want to at least take a look in this video and dissect exactly what that means, how this has played out throughout history, and if, in fact, uh, this is part of a larger picture, or if this is nothing at all, just a blip that will just evaporate and vanish. So to really find out if any of this is going to amount to anything at all, or if in fact it is the beginning stages to a revolution, uh, we are going to look at a chart that was loosely based off of ideas from The Anatomy of Revolution by Crane Brinton, a 1938 book that basically described uh, how several different revolutions of that era had gone down. Now, I've taken some of the research that was done by Crane Brinton and that book, and I've basically applied it to our modern day and take a look at some of the other revolutions and how they evolved over the last 90 years since this book was written. Now I'm going to be working off of a chart that I'm going to display right here that I basically modeled after the research that I found uh, while looking into this whole anatomy of a revolution idea. And the chart basically goes through four different stages. Stage one is the moderate or normal period, uh, where it is basically defined as an old order being in control, limited change, limited enfranchisement, uh, and a lot of class conflict. That leads into stage two, or the radical period, um, where it is basically defined as radicals gain control, major change happens, an increase in franchisement, a reign of terror and virtue may happen, uh, and the possible uh, assembly of dual power structures, something that I've talked a lot about before. Stage two, you guessed it, leads to stage three, which is the Thermidorian period. Uh, basically, that's defined as a reliance on a strong man or strong leader leadership, a new order is formed, a vision of the revolution is possibly forgotten, and a period of decadence ensues. And stage three leads then to stage four, the recovery period, where everything sort of recovers and comes back to a normal or a new normal, depending on how things turn out. Now I'm going to show a chart beside me here talking about stage one, and stage one is basically defined by having the old order still being in control, limited change, and limited enfranchisement, basically meaning uh, people's ability to vote or have a say in what happens within their society. It's important to note that within this stage, if all of the criteria aren't perfectly met, usually revolutions are often quelled. So we can pretty much say that most revolutions die within the first stage. Now the very first event in this stage is the decline. If you're to use the revolution as a flu uh, analogy, this is basically the incubation period. This is when all of the things that are happening within the society are bubbling up to the point of a spark or a breaking point when something happens. Now there are a lot of different things in this decline that result in the breaking point and if if a country is, in fact, in decline, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to a revolution. In some situations, the decline can happen and the country can just fall apart without any revolution and everything just becomes disarray, madness, and uh, usually ends in warlordism and factionalism 
and stuff like that. But some of the defining factors of a decline are massive inequality, famine, strife, war, disease, man-made or natural disasters, drought, economic collapse, incompetence, colonization, poverty, humiliation, taxation, execution debt, of innocence, increased increased bureaucracy, surveillance, restriction of corruption, loss of oppression, disenfranchisement, oppression, superstition, and factionalism. Now you could go on and on ad infinitum on all of the different things that add to a decline, but these are basically the main things that I've found in the revolutions that I've studied and the ones that we're going to talk about in this video. Now if you haven't noticed, the United States has many of those different characteristics already checked off the box. They're basically facing almost every single one of those problem. So I think it's fair to say that the United States is currently in a decline. And we can see other examples of other countries that were in sort of a decline uh, during their revolutionary period as well. For example, in imperialist Russia, Tsarist Russia, they had just finished uh, fighting the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905. They were facing economic collapse, poverty, massive inequality, humiliation from losing the war. There was the execution of innocents by the Tsar. There was massive brutality and bureaucracy, increased surveillance, corruption, disenfranchisement, loss of liberty, massive suppression of speech and assembly and press and exploitation across the board, and massive factionalism. That's what basically led to the spark that ignited the fire of the revolution in Russia. The decline of Tsarist Russia was going on for a long time. Tsar Nicholas was extremely incompetent and he was tormenting and torturing his people in many different ways. And it was basically inevitable that a spark would light that tinderbox and ignite a fire of revolution there as well. You can see basically the same sort of thing happening in imperialist China before they had their revolutionary period as well. They had just finished fighting the first Sino-Japanese War from 1849 to 1895. There was massive poverty, inequality, famine, natural disasters, incompetence of their leadership, humiliation from their leadership, and massive disenfranchisement all across the board, leading to the spark that ignited that tinderbox as well. And we can also see that in another example, uh, Germany. Right after World War I, Germany was in complete disarray. They lost the war and they were suffering from massive inequality, poverty, economic collapse, taxation, debt. Thanks to the Treaty of Versailles, they had a massive amount of debt that they had no way of ever paying back incompetence, corruption, superstition all across the board, assuming that the Jews were the ones that created all of the problems that led to them losing the war and a lot of different things like that. Again, all of which were a tinderbox just waiting for that spark. And again, we can talk about another place as well, a little bit more close to home, America. During the American Revolution, there was somewhat of a decline as well. During the American Revolution, they had just finished fighting the Franco-Indian War from 1754 to 1763. They were facing massive taxation, inequality, execution of innocents was being done by the British soldiers, and increased bureaucracy, overexpansion from the British Empire, disenfranchisement, loss of liberty, and exploitation was ranked throughout the British colonies of the United States as well. They weren't the United States yet, you understand what I'm saying. There was a lot of anger, there was a lot of animosity, and a lot of people wanted a change in the Americas. So obviously all of these countries are tinderboxes just waiting for a spark. And even though it wasn't necessarily just one event that led to the revolution, it was in fact more or less the decline that led to it, usually there's some event that sparks everyone into action. And in Russia, that spark was Bloody Sunday in 1905, where basically the Tsar killed a bunch of unarmed civilians. Bloody Sunday was a bit of a turning point. Obviously, no revolution is defined by one specific event, and obviously it happened quite a few years before the actual revolution, but it was a defining factor that brought a lot of demonstrations, a lot of activism, a lot of action to the streets of Tsarist Russia that led to the eventual 
overthrow and revolution in that country. In China, the killing of two priests in 1899 ended up leading to the Boxer Rebellion, which led itself to a bunch of different revolutions and eventually the overthrow of the monarchy or the empire that existed at the time. In Germany, a very similar thing happened in 1918, but nobody had to die thanks to it, at least not at the beginning. It actually started with the Kyle Mutiny, where a bunch of sailors decided to revolt and just not follow the orders of the Kaiser. It was more or less a symbolic gesture that showed that the people no longer believed in the monarchy, and the monarchy no longer had power over the people, and soon after that they had their own revolution as well. And circling back home to America, well not my home, but probably your home, uh, and the Boston Massacre, which happened in 1770, where British soldiers shot and killed several Americans who uh, I think were throwing snowballs at the, sn at the soldiers, or garbage or something like that. Anyway, they were causing a bit of a ruckus, so the British soldiers shot them, leading partially to the Boston Tea Party and the eventual Revolutionary War that led to the American Revolution. So there's the decline, the drying of that tinderbox, the spark that ignites that box of sticks and turns it into a smoldering fire, and that smoldering fire is usually civil unrest and civil war. Going back through the list again, we're going to talk about Russia and the February Revolution, which actually happened uh, in March, uh, March 8th, 1917. It was a different calendar back then. Um, then there was also China, which had the Boxer Rebellion. I talked about that a moment ago, which happened between 1899 and 1901. There was also the death of Emperor Zixi. I I'm positive I'm pronouncing that name wrong, which happened in 1908. The Wu Chang Uprising, which happened in 1911. The Xinghai Revolution, which happened in 1911 and 1912, which eventually led to the overthrow of the monarchy and the institution of a completely new government. Now, there are major differences between the February Revolution and the uh, revolutions that happened in China, specifically in regards to time scale. In Russia, the time scale between the February Revolution and the abdication of Tsar Nicholas was like seven days, whereas in China, the time scale between the Boxer Rebellion and the abdication of the last Emperor Poi was about a decade, 12 years or so. So there's no real way of knowing how long any of this could happen. And in fact, in Germany, it was very similar. After the Kyle Mutiny, there was really only one uprising that happened, and it was from the communists during the communist Spartacist uprising, which was basically a general strike from what I remember. And it was quelled very quickly by the Fry Corps. And back again to revolutionary America, where we had the Boston Tea Party and Paul Revere running through the streets screaming uh, that the British are coming, the British are coming, basically announcing the beginning of the Revolutionary War. All of these ended up leading to what I was alluding to a moment ago, a boiling point, or a point at which that fire has either completely engulfed everything and ran completely out of control, or where everything is exhausted, and that fire is snuffed out usually by the old order. Like I was saying at the very beginning, most revolutions end at this stage, and it's at the boiling point, the next thing that we're going to talk about, where they usually end. In the specific examples I have here, that isn't where it ended. It actually went on to the next stage, but in a lot of cases it is. Let's go through the list. In Russia, it was the abdication of Tsar Nicholas on March 15th, 1917. In China, it was the abdication of Emperor Pui uh, in 1911. I'm, I'm positive I'm pronouncing that word wrong. In Germany, it was the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm on November 9th, 1918, and the subsequent murder of Rosa Luxemburg, uh, on January 15th, 1919, just a couple months later, who was the leader of that communist uprising. And once she was murdered, it was basically free game. That was the start of the Weimar Republic. And of course, America and their Revolutionary War, which ended with the surrender of Lord Cornwallis on October 19th, 1781. Now, all of these different 
um, events are all part of stage one, the moderate period. And like I was saying at the beginning, most of these revolutions, most revolutions in general, usually end at stage one because it's such a large stage uh, that a lot of different factors have to be all coalescing at once for it to actually fully evolve into the next step and become something of a real revolution. Now, a lot of these different factors were involved during, say, the uprisings that happened um, during the American Civil War. But the American Civil War never fully became an actual revolution. It went through the decline, the spark, the civil unrest and civil war, and it even had a boiling point, but that boiling point resulted in the South losing and inevitably not being able to secede and become their own uh, country or state or whatever they wanted. Many revolutions are quelled at that stage, but if they're not, then they move on to stage two, the radical period. Now, it is important to note that stage one is basically the embodiment of class conflict. And it isn't really until stage two uh, where that conflict becomes resolved. Now, it is also important to note that early on in this stage, usually there are a group of intellectuals that have realized all of the flaws and problems within that first stage, within the old order, um, and basically come up with plans and ways to correct them. We see a lot of that going on right now. Heck, I do that every single day for a job. Uh, not saying that I'm an intellectual or anything like that, but we've seen that a lot, especially with the rise of Richard Wolff, uh, the popularization of Bernie Sanders and a lot of different things. Uh, there are a lot of people right now talking about the flaws, the massive flaws within the system. And usually those intellectuals are often followed by the rest of the proletariat or the rest of the public. Uh, once they realize that there are massive flaws as well, uh, they look at these new intellectuals as being somewhat of a guiding light. Stage two, or the radical period, or if you're looking at this as the revolution as a flu analogy, this would basically be the height of the fever. Stage two basically is defined by radicals gaining control, major change, an increase in franchisement, reign of terror or virtue, and dual power. The reign of terror itself refers directly to the French Revolution and the Jacobins, where back then, all of the old order or the elites were basically uh, purged so the new order could come into power. The idea was that they could never form a new society if the old order stayed alive. And that's where you ended up with a lot of heads on pikes and that sort of thing. <laughs> kind of where the guillotine meme comes from. Now, the idea behind this reign of terror in referring to communist revolutions, uh, they're basically referring to the purges that happened in Soviet Russia and also in communist China when they were getting rid of the old uh, order and replacing it with the new one. Now, do I agree with the way that communist China and Soviet Russia handled their revolution after they actually revolted? Absolutely not. I have a lot of different criticisms for many, many things that they've done. The honest truth is that when you use methods throughout your revolution that are counter to the revolutionary goals that you seek, then you will inevitably lead yourself in the wrong direction, not towards a revolution, but back towards reactionary behavior. The means you use to conduct your revolution have to reflect the ideals and goals of your revolution. And when you use ideas such as the dictatorship of the proletariat, where you give a certain number of people within the proletariat complete and total authority to do whatever they want, laws be damned, that is basically the definition of a dictatorship, then you create a problem where you don't lead yourself towards a free society. You don't lead yourself towards a stateless, classless, moneyless society by using forms of revolution that basically institute a state, a class, and forms of money. And even Crane admits that there are a lot of different countries that go through revolutions without ever having any sort of reign of terror. 
a lot of the times, even if you look at certain countries having this reign of terror, you can tell that it's not really a reign of terror, it's more or less a civil war that was still going on. But there are a lot of examples where a lot of different countries don't actually use any sort of reign of terror at all. Uh, for example, the United States never had any sort of reign of terror. It wasn't necessarily because they wouldn't have had to, it's more or less to do with their geographic location. It was so hard for the British Empire to actually go overseas all that way to suppress any of the movements that were happening in the United States that after the United States gained their independence, they basically signed some treaties and that was it because it was too taxing on the British Empire to continue the fight. They live too far away. But when you have an occupying force that occupies the exact same territory as the revolutionary group, then obviously there are going to continue to be antagonisms between those two groups. For example, in communist China, after the communist revolution, there were still a lot of nationalists around from the old order. And a lot of those old order nationalists were dealt with by the communists uh, in very violent, repressive ways. Basically, the ideas behind the authoritarian communists doing this is that the old order, the bourgeoisie or the capitalists, they have to be ripped off and hacked away uh, or they will inevitably gain back control again. They're counter-revolutionaries. Uh, whereas the anarchists, people like myself and others, believe in a much, much different tactic when it comes to uh, dealing with counter-revolutionary movements. In our view, we basically want to do everything we absolutely can to reform the enemy, to make sure that they don't uh, regress again, and to actually have them see that what we are offering isn't a bad thing. Uh, it's not forceful, it's not coercive, it's just literally treating the enemy with kindness, decency, and humanity rather than treating them like animals, like they would inevitably treat us. That's what it means to not believe in punitive justice. We want to do everything we can to not resort to punishing those individuals. We want to teach them that what they believe is probably wrong, and if they are absolutely, irreconcilably not going to change their minds, I don't know, then we'll ship them to Siberia or something. Now with all that being said, there are two main events that happen within stage two, and that is basically the regime change and possible further decline. The problem with a lot of revolutions is that they don't start off necessarily with a coherent idea or ideology to basically fill the gap after the revolution happens. A lot of the time, there's no stopping the snowball that's bringing forth that revolution, so there aren't really uh, any ideas behind what a lot of people are coming up with. So eventually, it ends up leading to something known as a provisional government, or in this case, basically a moderate-style government uh, that basically fills the gap between the old order and the new order. But this provisional government holds an extremely difficult job. What it basically has to do is take care of all of the necessities of the entire country, while at the same time trying to cater to the radical groups that are left. Of course, there are going to be the people from the old order fighting for the old ways to come back into power, and there are going to be people from the possible new order, or the radicals, fighting for this new paradigm shift to actually occur. And there's no real way for the provisional government to satisfy both groups. So inevitably, the provisional government or the temporary government that was put in place ends up falling and ends up being replaced by whatever group is more organized, more well-equipped, and better prepared. Sometimes this can happen in a couple of months, and sometimes this can take several decades. It really depends on the disarray that happens after the old order falls. Obviously, there is a power vacuum that is created, and a lot of things can happen in the meantime. So, even though it seems like some sort of stable government was put into place right after the revolution, oftentimes that stable government just erodes away and succumbs to all of the internal pressures that had already built up over the course of several decades or however long that it took for that decline to actually happen. So, for example, in Russia, there was the provisional government, which ended up coming into power uh, in March of 1917 and only lasted eight months uh, until November of 1917, where it was overthrown by the Bolsheviks, who had the largest group at the 
the time and was easily able to take control over the underpowered provisional government. The whole thing only took about eight months. But we can contrast that with China where something very, very different happened. After the revolution and the fall of the old order, the fall of the uh, dynasty, the Qing dynasty, uh, there was no real power that took control. Obviously, the nationalists had the largest party and they had the largest scope. They were able to take control of the majority of the country, but that didn't mean that they had full control over anything. And in fact, it ended up leading to 39 years of factionalism, of civil war, of warlordism, and different groups over time taking different amounts of power throughout the entire history of China over that period. The Republic of China, which was essentially somewhat of a provisional government, it didn't really hold control over the entire country, lasted from 1912 to 1949, 37 years. Uh, I think I said 39 a minute ago, but it was 37 years that it lasted. It wasn't until after decades of civil war, not to mention fighting the second Sino-Japanese war, that Mao, uh, Mao Zedong, was actually able to take control of all of China and turn it into a unified country. And from my estimate, estimation, it looks very much like the Weimar Republic in Germany was also a type of provisional government or temporary moderate government uh, that existed up until uh, the rise of Hitler, so about 14 years from 1919 to 1933. Typically, the reason why the radical group takes control of the more moderate provisional government during this time is because they have fully built dual power structures. Now, I talk a lot about dual power structures on this channel, and I usually talk about them in their very earliest stages, where I'm talking about right now in America or Canada, setting up, say, free stores or community gardens or housing cooperatives or that sort of thing. But by this stage, those uh, dual power structures really have become dual power structures. They inevitably become just as powerful, if not more powerful, than the current government. And this is where the revolutionary tactics that I talk about in regards to dual power structures are so important, because if people in a community are working to feed, clothe, and house other people within that community, they're going to have popular support, making it extremely hard for a group of armed rebels to come in and take that entire town because they will inevitably fight for their freedom. They will fight to keep control of their area. If one side is feeding their bellies, their hearts, and their minds, and the other side is feeding them bullets, what side do you think they're going to take? Now, unfortunately, during this second stage, during this radical period, there is often further decline. And that happens because, well, an old order was just taken out and a new one has to find its legs and find out how it can actually govern and take control. For example, in Russia, they had the Civil War from 1917 to 1922, where the Red Army, the Black Army, the Green Army, and the White Army all fought against each other for supremacy over Russia. In China, like I was saying before, they ended up resulting in a lot of different problems for a very long time. Uh, in Russia, it was only about a five-year period where they had to actually worry about massive factionalism and uh, all of this infighting and civil war. But in China, it ended up lasting for, like I said, 37 years, which resulted in warlordism be, uh, from between 1916 to 1928, a civil war which happened from 1927 to 1949, the Second Sino-Japanese War, which was from 1937 to 1945, basically right in the middle of that civil war, and then finally the Communist Revolution, which happened from 1948 to 1952, which also the entire time had factionalism, a complete lack of control, and like I was saying, warlords fighting against each other to basically take territory and gain control. Those are two radically different time periods. If you look at the Bolsheviks, they took basically eight months and roughly five years of a civil war to fully revolutionize or to change entirely the governmental system in Russia, whereas in China, 
it took a lot longer than that. And all of these different factors have specifically to do with the different countries or different areas in which these revolutions are happening in. Context is key when it comes to revolution. Every revolutionary movement is different and every single one has to be adapted to its own situation. Germany, like I was talking about before with the Weimar Republic, again, that was basically a type of provisional government, a moderate style government that was in place between the old order and the new order or the Third Reich. The entire time the Weimar Republic existed, it dealt with massive problems. It had to deal with the hyperinflation crisis from 1921 to 1923, which resulted in the Berlin hyperinflation riots, which happened in 1923. There was also the occupation of the Ruhr region. I'm pronouncing all of these German words wrong. Uh, from 1923 to 1925, the Wall Street crash from 1929, Bloody May, which was a communist riot, which happened in 19. 29, 5 million people ended up becoming unemployed from the financial crisis in 1932, resulting in the election of Adolf Hitler, bringing Germany from stage two directly into stage three. Now, before we move on to stage three, I do want to note that in stage two, there is a strong chance that this can result in a cycle of further decline and more regime change. If there's no revolutionary strategy or popular support, a new order will be unable to form, mm. resulting in a constant cycle of regime change and further decline. You can actually see a very similar trend happening all the way back from the fall of Rome, where there wasn't any real major superpower that could take control of the area at the time, resulting in a thousand years of feudalism. Okay, so if that cycle is broken, if they're able to break that fever, then inevitably what you reach is the Thermidorian period, or stage three, uh, the New Order. Now, the New Order can be defined in a lot of different ways, but often it has a reliance on a strong man or extremely strong leadership. Uh, the New Order itself is formed from the ashes of the old. A vision of revolution is often forgotten, and a period of decadence can ensue. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to lead to a period of decadence, and there doesn't necessarily have to be a strong man in the form of, say, a Hitler or a Mussolini or anything like that to take the country or to take the nation or to take that community to a new paradigm. But what is required is strong leadership. And you have to remember that leadership is not the same as rulership. Leaders should be able to sound the charge and rally the troops, but they aren't there to command the people. The people have to be the ones that command themselves to a new revolution. Like I was saying before, the means of the revolution are as important as the ends. And if we don't follow the spirit of our revolutionary goals within those means, then inevitably we will result in a dictatorship ourselves. Leadership is important, it's ancient, and it's huge. Human, but the way that we've perverted it through this idea that leaders necessarily have to be rulers is completely false, and it's antithetical to anything even resembling humanity. Leadership is important in situations where you don't know how to move forward and someone else does. Leadership is important in your job. If somebody knows more than you, they are able to teach and show you how to move forward. They're able to give you confidence and motivation and drive to push forward that goal. But they shouldn't control you. They shouldn't rule you. They shouldn't be the ones that dictate to you how to move forward. They should be a guiding light, not an iron fist. If we allow this period to be controlled by a tyrant, by a ruler, and not by the people, it will result in the old order just coming back into power. It becomes a restoration period where the old order is able to find its way back and take back control. This is what's referred to when a lot of socialists and leftists talk about a bourgeois revolution. The old order just finds its way back into power. This happened in France, this happened in England, and this happened in America. Even though the United States used the power of the people to gain their sovereignty and to fight for their freedom, it was a bourgeois revolution. The people that took control weren't the people at the bottom, they were the people at the top. They were the wealthy landowners, the businessmen, the capitalists, the bourgeoisie. They were taking control back from the monarchy. 
and they ended up putting themselves in control of the country. The American Revolution wasn't a people's revolution, it was a revolution of the bourgeois class, and they used the people to obtain that revolution, sure. But afterwards, regular people didn't have a chance to vote, there was no suffrage, the only people that were allowed to actually have an opinion on the way the country was ran were white, wealthy landowners. There were a lot of different tests, specifically religious tests and all sorts of other tests, that stopped anybody except for white, wealthy capitalists and landowners to be the ones that got the vote. And it wasn't until about 50 years after uh, the formation of America where white people, just general regular white men were given the ability to vote, and another 50 years after that before black people were given the ability to vote. And even then, their vote was only worth three-fifths of what a white person's vote was, and let's not even start to discuss women or people that are in prison or naturalized citizens. The United States has never really given anybody the ability to vote or have their opinions heard. Uh, except for the bourgeois class. And you can see that even now, through gerrymandering and through all sorts of other voter suppression, your vote doesn't really matter even today. And obviously, decadence became the norm of the United States, especially in the bourgeois class. They just became lazy, they relaxed, and they started indulging in every luxury they possibly could. Now, going back to my examples, in Russia, they formed the Soviet Union from 1922 to 1991, a total of 69 years, nice. Also, China, which became the People's Republic of China from 1949 to present day, uh, which was 79 years. And also, Germany, which resulted in the Third Reich, uh, which lasted from 1933 to 1945, a total of 12 years, and, of course, America, the United States, was formed from 1776 to present day, a total of 244 years. Now, obviously, a lot of people are probably asking themselves, why would I put the Third Reich um, in the new order when clearly the Third Reich uh, was defeated very quickly? And it's because the Third Reich, as opposed to the Weimar Republic, um, actually became more or less a unified country. Before then, uh, a lot of different factional groups were gearing for control over Germany. Specifically, the Nazis were one of them. Uh, the communists were another. And Nazi Germany, for the most part, for the most part, stabilized uh, itself uh, because it created basically a war economy. All of those uh, millions of people that were unemployed just before the uh, uprise of Hitler, they all got jobs working to basically build the war machine. The economy, for the most part, recovered, even though I wouldn't necessarily call it a recovery. Uh, most of it was based off of IOUs. But for the most part, Germany's economy recovered, and it was only then destroyed or snuffed out uh, by World War II, and the Allied armies collectively coming in and destroying Germany. Now, interestingly, Nazi Germany did have its own reign of terror. It wasn't communist terrorism. It was uh, national socialist terrorism. But they basically purged a lot of the people that they thought were the wealthy elites of their time. Uh, a lot of the Jews, that sort of thing, while keeping many of the wealthy bourgeoisie and the wealthy business owners still intact. And all of that eventually leads to stage four the recovery period, uh, where the new order basically recovers and becomes whatever it would have become. And this is where the actions throughout the entire revolution are so important. This is where they all coalesce uh, and become an actuality, because if all of the actions that you take up to your revolution are counter-revolutionary to your goals, your outcome, like I was saying before, if your means to the revolution do not reflect the ends that you desire, then you end up feeding the authoritarian monster that you created through that revolutionary period. And giving that monster national control over absolutely everything and a monopoly on violence doesn't quell the beast. So during stage four, through this recovery period, a new paradigm is formed, and it can really go in several different directions. But the three main directions that a lot of the revolutions that I've studied have followed um, are either through convalescence, restoration, 
or through reignition. Convalescence is basically going off of the flu theory, where eventually the revolution dies down and the country is able to basically recover from that fever and come out stronger and better than ever before. The example that is often used is the United States, how it was able to come out of its revolution stronger and more powerful than ever. Uh, but there are also other directions that you can go in, such as a restoration period, like I was talking about before, where basically the old order is able to take back control of the revolution uh, and basically reinstitute themselves as the ones in control. Specifically, this is exactly what happened in France, when eventually Napoleon just came and took control uh, over the entire territory, putting back in control the bourgeoisie class and completely eliminating the ability for the workers uh, to actually hold and control the power in that country. But another direction this recovery period could go in is reignition, where basically the ideals of that revolutionary movement are reignited and the revolution continues. And you can see that uh, basically with the five-year plans uh, from Stalin in uh, Russia. And you can also see that further down the line in America when they had the uh, Civil War. You could say that it happened again in the 1930s with the New Deal legislations that happened after the Wall Street crash. And you could also even say that it happened again uh, during the Civil Rights Movement and all of the reforms that were made therein. Now, it is important to note that a revolution can happen without ever having any of these other factors involved. Uh, for example, the Industrial Revolution never really had any sort of decline. It never really had a regime change. It never had any of those things. It was essentially a different kind of revolution but a revolution nonetheless. And you can also have revolutions in other fashions as well. Uh, a very common form of revolution and the kind of revolution that a lot of people think of when they're thinking about revolution is something known as a political revolution. And that's something that Bernie Sanders talks a lot about, where it's basically a change-up of the ruling class. Essentially, the idea behind a political revolution is it changes up who owns and controls the political sphere, but it basically leaves class property relations completely intact. So even though they might have a change of hands from a lord to a government official, essentially the employer-employee relationship or the master-slave or the uh, king-serf relationship, the exploiter-exploited relationship uh, still exists. So the American Revolution was essentially a bourgeois revolution where the old control, the old order, uh, gained back control of the country. The Soviet Revolution revolution was essentially a political revolution where the politics and the lords and ladies were replaced by the government, uh, but essentially the property relations didn't change. And you can basically say the same thing with Germany as well, where essentially they had a political bourgeois revolution uh, where they basically just changed hands on who owned and controlled the means of production within the elite class. So kind of a shuffling of the cards without actually making the real revolutionary change change uh, that needed to be made. So that's it. That's everything. Those are the four stages of revolution. Now, are we currently in one of those stages? Yes, absolutely. We are currently in the decline stage. We may have even seen uh, with the uh, riots and with the uprisings, with the insurrections that have been happening because of the death of George Floyd, we may have even seen the spark of a revolution happen in front of our eyes. And right now we are currently facing obvious civil unrest and God help us, a possible civil war. Now, does that mean that inevitably it's going to lead to a revolution? Well, like I said before, not necessarily. It could end up leading to the old order just quashing uh, the new revolutionary movement and instituting more draconian laws and putting themselves more firmly into control and more firmly in power. But fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the decline is inevitable. Even if there isn't a revolutionary movement to follow with that decline, the decline of the United States will happen regardless. And there really isn't much that any one of us can do about that because inevitably this is the course of history. Every single political or economic system that has ever existed was created, rose to power, held control for a while, and then died. And there's no reason to believe that capitalism is any different. 
At least, that's the way I look at it. If you do get a chance, please check out all of the links in the description box below. Hit that little bell button because they are not going to tell you when I release another video. And make sure you're subscribed because they're unsubscribing people every single day. Thank you very much for watching. Have a nice day.